Is there anybody else I forgot to introduce? Forgive me. And then you can introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, I would just say that um, I've known Kwaku quite a while. This is Alexander again. And um, I'm a Calypsonian. <laughs> and I'm also very interested in um, history, particularly Caribbean history here. I've actually got a song, which I know Kwaku's promised to play. I was very honoured to be, um, in last November, there was an event from, um, for Lady Jocelyn Barrow, for Dame Jocelyn Barrow in London, and I had written a song to, um, to greet her or to, to, to remember. So um, as a Calypsonian, I'm actually a musical journalist. I don't have any big stardom problems or anything like that. I've written about a thousand songs because I'm Calypsonian in residence for the BBC, and I just write about people. And I have to admit now, I have not yet written a song about the great Claudia Jones, even though I know all about her. It's just, <laughs> it's banking up on me, but I'm going to get around to it soon. So good evening, everybody. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing what's going to be said. Thank you. Respect. Hopefully, I mean, one person just come in. So uh, the room will fill, but it's about who is where and you are here. So thank you very much. I know our last cell, my colleague, has done the, the thank you. So I appreciate it. Uh, Yana, it's great to have you uh, all the way from America. She's one of the featured personalities, by the way. Let me finish the video thing because that gives us some idea of the personalities that we're highlighting. And then it's open. So probably uh, I'll let Yana, because uh, she's featured in one of the Hello? Videos. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> we, we can hear you, okay. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Apologies. I'm sitting here frantically trying to press in. Such a wonderful opportunity to see what's going on from across the pond. I just applaud everybody that's made this event happen today. I've told my mom to watch. And okay. a few so just an honor to be here. Thank you so much. You're more than welcome, you're more than welcome. Can I just say before I forget, respect to Battersea Library for the last five or how many years I've been doing, they call it Black History Month, now sometime it went to Diversity Month, <laughs> and now it's gone back the last couple of years to Black History Month. I do African History Month, it's the same thing, but that's the reason why I want to put the focus on African. So, uh, I've been doing the gigs for them, as I said, for the last five or six years. So respect to them. They're part of Wandsworth Libraries. So that is why we can do this and have it free. So that's cool. So after Yana is maybe spoken and maybe people might want to ask her questions, depending on what they see in the video, then uh, Blossom, you can come in because they have had a good idea of what's captured on, on, on the video. Then we'll take it. So there's supposed to be quite a bit of a conf conversational piece. I hear people saying, oh, we're interested in history, so we're coming to learn history. Now, let me tell you something. You're not going to get the stuff that you're going to, you can go to Wikipedia. That's going to tell you 1972, she, she was made a dame, 19 whatever. It's about some of the histories that I don't get because what I do is I have conversations with some of the people. Certainly those are my video. So you're getting the privilege of hearing different perspectives, not in the written word, but in the spoken words directly from the people. Obviously, those that have died have captured things that speak to their existence. So uh, without further ado, because I'm mindful that I get the videos out of the way and the conversation, I have to tell you, since September, was it August, we started doing these things. The after program discussions have been fantastic. You don't believe we've sometimes gone not over one hour, but over two hours, people just want the space. You see, John, 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 she's nodding. She's one of those people. She can stay till I say, I have to close now. I've got a live, <laughs> you know. So what I've done with the November sessions is to really make it a two-hour program. So at least we've got one hour uh, before nine o'clock to have those dis discussions. So in this program, we're going to have quite a bit of time to, do, to have a chat. And I have to say, the advantage of uh, Zoom over the real world is that uh, the library is close at eight. So whenever we're doing programs, getting to eight, they pretty much want to shoo us out of the building. So all this is uh, build, that, build, that, build that's closing at eight, inevitably sort of wound down about five to eight. And, you know, we had to be kicked out so they could do their security thing in lockdown. So 
for the last few months, I've been doing six to nine windows. So that's me yabbering over there. So now I'm going to try and do the technology, but I want those praying people to pray that the technology works. So I'm just going to pray quickly and not silent. In fact, you know something? I'm going to defer to Yana because Yana, uh, you promote yourself as a gospel artist, correct? You, you weren't yes, a secular okay. market. So why don't we, I give you the honor of giving us a little prayer and invoking Jesus' name and that the technology works and then we, we kick off in terms of the video. So please go ahead. That's wonderful. So Heavenly Father, I thank you today for this wonderful event. I thank you, Lord, that you are causing your people to draw from the north, the yes. east, the south, today father god we bind and we block the attempts of the enemy to affect any of our electronics any of our phones any of the frequencies and we ask lord that you send your frequency we ask that clear the airwaves lord and that there is just such a, a, a space father god for the dynamics of communication education upliftment to happen today father god i thank you for all the speakers on the call today. <laughs> ask lord that even after the program airs and is sent out again there will be waves and waves of people who are uh, empowered and educated through this works in jesus name we thank you amen amen, amen. thank you very much yana it's interesting that you said even if this program is sent out normally <laughs> What I do yeah. is I, when I finish, I do film, record them, but I say yeah. for ar archival purposes, so I haven't put anything out. Ah. But, the, but in this particular case, the libraries ask if they can get some representation. So I will do a special edit because I didn't want to show the whole video because I do sell the video as a <laughs> DVD. So that certainly will go out for people to watch later. So, you know, the Lord <laughs> is speaking through you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nana is uh, one of my co-hosts. Welcome, Nana. Uh, what I'll do, just to prime you normally, I'll just throw you in the deep end. We have got a poem that we did when we did the video. Actually, maybe I should give a little background before I just jump into it. I think in 2010, I did a program called, oh my gosh, my, my, my head. Roma, oh, okay, it was a Heritage Funder project. And we looked at male role models. Obviously, in terms of the DVD, you could only uh, film people who were alive. So, uh, we, uh, so we, all, we could only film people who were alive in the, in the 2000s. But the, the written part went across 100 years. It was 1907 to 2007. So I uh, highlighted a whole range of what we call African male role models. And so I did a DVD and the, the book, and people were saying, oh, why just a man? Why just a man? Let me tell you, what happened was, I don't know if you remember, but 10, 15 years ago, there was a raft of stories, particularly in The Voice, about the dysfunctional uh, African families, or the absent fathers, and no male role models. So we had a project to say they are role models, and they're not necessarily, they are celebrities and uh, uh, musicians, even though I am the, in the music business. And I was quite encouraged that a lot of people, so the question was, who are your role models? And most people either speak to close family members, maybe a mom or a father, occasionally a teacher, which was also encouraging. So based on that, I went out and found it, and, and I remember coming to uh, interview Yana at her place, uh, it was quite far. I don't know where, where were you living in Yana. Where were you living in in, in London? Uh, it was I was in Southeast, but uh, I remember I had a apartment store in Brixton, and then I had a boutique in Broccoli. Okay. And Deptford. Well, for for a North London person, wherever I came was so far off, but I had to do it. And thank thank you for uh, giving us the time to I interview you. So the idea was that. Uh, we highlighted a number, we're hoping to have done a series, but as of now, it's just the one. Women to tell us about the challenges, how they overcame it and stuff. And the idea was to encourage other people, not just girls, but I think girls in particular, but young people, not even Africans, young people who are hearing messages of empowerment from people who've been there and done it. So that was why I did a program called... Um, I always forget my titles. I always forget what my titles. What, thank you. What they said I should be, the, uh, the, the story of African British uh, female movers and shakers. So let me tell you how the title came about quickly. 
or the titles, what the site should be. One of the people I interviewed and she inspired the program was the then uh, Attorney General Baroness Scotland. And I had read somewhere that she said when she was young and uh, I think she used to work in Sainsbury's and um, when she sp spoke to the careers officer, the careers officer asked her, what does she want to do when she grows up? And she said, oh, she wants to be a lawyer. I said, ha, ha, ha. Look, don't set your size too high. I'm sure some of you may have heard those type of stories. Uh, what do you do during the holidays and stuff? And she said that uh, she worked at, 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 at Sainsbury's. So uh, the, the careers officer said, you know something? If you're a bit more diligent, you could rise to become a supervisor. And so um, not that being a supervisor and saying this isn't a, 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 a good job if it, it, it's, it's what you want, but people have aspirations and sometimes we kill that aspiration. So obviously she went on to become a lawyer, so it wasn't impossible for, for, for her. So that inspired me to use that in the, in the title of the DVD. The library, being the statutory body, you know, I, I do intellectual property. Uh, a lot of these organizations don't want to uh, get involved in copyright situations. So they said, Kwaku, have you got something that you own the copyright because we don't want to, you know, get involved in that? I said, yeah, I've got a few uh, original footage. So what I've done is use footage of things that I've done in the past because I tend to document uh, things and um, the kind of ready, ready, not steady go, ready go, you know, because I captured the moment. How many people have I captured? And if I was waiting for everything to be to, together, I would have missed the boat. Some sadly have passed away. So I just captured things, well, you know. So anyway, yeah, so what I've done, obviously one of the DVDs is called what they said I should be. So that we're going to see most of that. And then I did something looking at representations of African life in London. So that, that, that would have been buildings, statues, uh, names of streets and stuff. So I've taken stuff from, from, from that as well. And then I think there are one or two things that I have done. So I've put together something. Yeah, no, things are working. So I'm just going to press play and we go. The sound comes later, so don't, don't, don't stress yourself. The sound will come later. But I also believe that it is part of our own responsibility as communities, as parents, as elders in, in our communities to ensure that we learn our own history. You know, it is our responsibility to educate our children about who they are and give them a sense of identity because that is a fact. You've got a lovely smile if you don't mind me saying so. <laughs> I was called to the bar um, and became a practicing barrister at the age of 21. At 35, I became a Queen's Council, that's a senior barrister, part of the inner um, core of the bar, the inner bar. Um, I was 35, I was the youngest um, barrister uh, for about 200 years to be made a Queen's Council, and was the first black woman. I then became um, the first uh, black woman to become uh, a Deputy High Court Judge, the first to become uh, a, a, a master of my inn, which is Middle Temple, and then I was the first to become um, a peer in the House of Lords, the first to become a minister. I was a minister at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Um, I then became uh, a Privy Councillor, and after that I spent some time as the second um, in command at the Lord Chancellor's Department, and I became number two for four years at the Home Office. And then two years ago, I became the first woman uh, and the first black person in 700 years to be the Attorney General. And the Attorney General is the chief legal advisor to the government, to the uh, parliament, and to Her Majesty. I super advise and superintend all prosecutorial authorities in this country. And I'm a third role, is the go independent guardian of the rule of law, so I support um, the people of this country. And I'm the most senior law officer and the leader of the bar. Well, I came to uh, 
United Kingdom when I was about two and a half. I was uh, the tenth of my parents' twelve only children. I say that because for each of us, um, my parents treated us as if we were the only child they had. There were seven boys and five girls, and we lived first of all in Paddington and then in Walthamstow, uh, which is where I went to school. My mother is a, was a very devout Catholic, and my father was a very devout Methodist, and they brought us up in a very ecumenical home, which really meant that we had to concentrate on what we had to give as opposed to what we didn't have. And they used to tell each of us that each of us had a talent, and it was our job to find that talent, to hone it, and then use it for the benefit of others. And they constantly said there was no such word as can't until you tried, tried, and tried again. And that failure, uh, there was no disgrace in failure. The only disgrace is in not having tried. I think when I was um, growing up in the East End of London, there were relatively <coughs> few black people in the schools in the area where I grew up. And I think there was a very uh, limited expectation of you if you were a, a black child. You weren't expected to be academic, you weren't expected uh, to achieve. And indeed, there were very few uh, people, role models, in different jobs to enable you to think it may be possible. And so um, when I decided I wanted to be a lawyer, um, I didn't receive a great deal of encouragement. The whole of my family um, have been encouraged to do science because both my mother, but particularly my father, saw science and technology as the new world, it was a portable skill. So I had in mind that it was my father wanted me to visit this, and here I was um, wanting to do law. So I thought I'd talk this over with my careers advisor, who told me that um, I shouldn't raise my aspirations so high that I might be disappointed. And she asked me whether I did anything, um, any form of work at weekends, and I said that I worked in Sainsbury's, which was a fantastic shop, actually. It was really good uh, people to be employed by. And um, she then suggested that if I worked really hard, maybe I could um, rise to the heights of being a supervisor in Sainsbury's, and maybe that was a more suitable aspiration for me to have. I think I'd give them the same advice that my parents gave me, and that is to identify what your talents are for yourself. Be clear about what they are, be realistic, and then really work hard. And don't let other people be the arbiter of what you do or you can't do. I was devastated when um, the careers advisor suggested that I couldn't be a lawyer. And but for my family, I might have listened to her. But I went home and uh, my um, story was actually met with hilarity, with my brothers and sisters saying, that's nothing. Listen to what they said about me. And many of them had been told something similar. They couldn't be an agronomist or uh, um, an agricultural, just an agricultural chemist or a pharmacologist or a biochemist because nobody had seen a black person do that before. It's a pleasure to be doing this interview with BTWCSC. <laughs> My name is Dawn Butler. I'm the Member of Parliament for Brent South. I'm one of only three black women who've ever been elected to Parliament. Currently, there were two black women sitting here in the House, and I am one. I'm also the first female MP ever to serve in a British government. In the history of our government, I'm the first black woman MP ever to be sitting around that table. I remember one teacher in particular, my history teacher, I spent a long time doing a piece of history homework, studied really hard, my neatest handwriting, and when I handed it in and when I got it back, I got a D, and I thought this must be some mistake, why have I been given a D? And when I spoke to the teacher, she said it was because I cheated, and I didn't cheat, but she thought that work was too good to come from me. So you can imagine when you've worked so hard on something, to have somebody then throw it back at you and say, this is too good to come from you, what it felt like. So um, I basically left school, went home, told my dad, I was furious, I was so mad. And uh, my dad went up the school, because my dad worked um, nights, he went up the school and had a chat with his teacher. And, but she was quite adamant that, you know, Dawn had never handed in this piece of work 
before of this quality. Well, I was going through a transition, if you like, where I didn't quite like history, but I decided to challenge myself. I'm the kind of person that will always challenge myself. So if I don't like something, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to do it. It just might mean that on that particular day, I wanted to prove that if I could, I could do it well, and I did. Um, but there was another teacher, Mr. Taylor, and he turned, if you like, my learning experience around because he took a real interest in teaching me. And he was my computer teacher. And if you like, when I left um, school and college, when I left, I became a computer programmer. And really, that was in homage to my computer teacher because it was an industry or an environment or profession where I could use my brain, my intellect, uh, but it wasn't really me in terms of engaging with people, which is what I love to do the most. How do I, how do I combat all the negativity? Because there is an awful lot of negativity. I remember when I wanted to be a lawyer and the teacher said to me, you're not going to be a lawyer. Why do you want to be a lawyer? Why don't you become a secretary? And that was it for me. I just stopped typing. We used to learn to touch type. I was learning to touch, I stopped typing because I thought I'm not going to be a secretary, so I don't need that skill. Uh, I do need that skill, actually. Um, but, you know, you kind of, I would rebel. Like, they said to me, the school said to me, why don't you just concentrate on your running because you're so fast. That was it, I stopped running because I wasn't going to be dictated to to do something that I didn't want to do. And I think, um, you have to have strength of character for that, you really do. My strength of character came from my family, first and foremost. I always knew who I was. I am a black woman, um, and I'm happy and proud to be a black woman. When I was in the civil service, they had a training course called Double Disadvantaged, and the first thing I did was raise an objection to that title. I'm not double disadvantaged because I'm a black woman. I might be double discriminated against, but I'm not, it's no disadvantage, trust me, being a black woman. So I was completely offended by that. So we had that debate before we could even start the course. It is your light, not your darkness, that frightens them. So um, what I say is you are this super person, this super being. And when somebody throws something at you like kryptonite, let's say, what you do is you put that in a box, in your lead-lined box. Incidentally, uh, the briefcases, the red briefcases, the um, ministers carry are all lead-lined. You put them in a lead-lined box and you stand on it. And you say to that person that's throwing you that kryptonite to weaken you, you say, thank you very much because you filled my box. It is now a stepping stone, which I will step on, which will make me taller and will help me to reach my goals. Mm, blood, blood. Is this a woman? This is it. Okay, my name is Mavis Amankwa and I'm the MD of Rich Visions. Rich Visions is an ethnic communications agency based in the heart of Stratford. What we do is that we offer services to mainly public sector organisations wishing to reach ethnic minority communities and diverse communities. As a young child, you know, coming from Africa, I used to get quite teased a lot from a lot of my, um, you know, uh, other pupils at school and also um, from other Caribbeans as well so when my mum said to me at the age of 15 we're going to Africa I said oh no I don't want to go because you swing on trees there and when I went to Africa Ghana to be precise I realized the place was really beautiful I had a lot of passion so from there I started organizing lots of events um, within the African Caribbean community for those in the diaspora to understand that Africa is a lovely place it's not you know stereotypical of what you hear or the prejudices that you hear as well so from from there I kind of was always organising events alongside my um, IT career and then 2004 I gave it all up and said I'm going to go and start my own business. Um, I think the values really comes from my background where I said as I was young I had a lot of adversity being African and also when I was at school I had lots of challenges there and when it got to when I was around 16 or so um, I started becoming quite disruptive in school and you know just realizing where am I going you know I needed someone to point me in the right direction so from there I kind of um, you know had quite a few mentors and coaches and my parents that kind of mentored me through I passed my GCSEs and from there I started studying IT uh, so I really I say the values comes from my passion and the kind of strong background that I have from my parents and family really a lot of the 
turnarounds for my life or, or for my career was basically facing a lot of adversity. I had many teachers who told me that I wasn't going to amount to nothing, um, that I was no good, I wouldn't be able to um, progress in my life because I, I, I wasn't really studying. And I think that basically was a challenge for me where I wanted to prove to them that I was, you know, going to be someone who was going to be distinctive and unique and here I am today. Right. Did, did, did the squeaking interrupt oh, a bit? I frequently get emails uh, from young girls saying I want to start my own cosmetics brand, what do I do? Um, I did a three-year degree in science, so that's the first place to start. Get your education, get taken seriously that you can handle, you have the capacity to handle the information and the knowledge that it takes to, to release a brand, unless you're a celebrity and somebody's doing it for you. I was brought born in Birmingham and um, both my mother and father came to the UK when they were about 16 years old and they had a very strong work, work ethic. My father was self-employed um, tradesman and there wasn't anything he couldn't fix, electrician, plumbing, carpentry, mechanics and my mother worked um, in administration. My mum was really one for excellence and quality and details. Anything my mum did, even if it was just giving you dinner, it would always look nice, it always smelled nice. She was a quite proud person. She'd always tidy up before guests came. And so you always had this, um, this recognition of hospitality and serving people well. And then with my dad's sort of ability to have customer service and to meet people's needs, but I, I find that it was you were steered into some very safe and very low level positions and then your parents also had high expectations and didn't really want you to take up anything that was too creative because I'm, I'm a published songwriter that's how I started in the industry but at the time my mum said no that's not a proper job get a proper job first and you can do your music later on. Number one you've got to realise your potential you've got to look at what you can do realistically and how are you going to get there Everything has a journey and personal development is, is where it all starts. Don't be unrealistic, but don't, don't uh, kill your dream. Nothing is impossible, but you've got to work really hard. You've got to really have a thick skin to things that would hold you back and discourage you and keep persevering, no matter, no matter even if you're the only person that can see that vision. You've just got to keep going and be very single-minded about reaching that goal, not get put off. Um, I think that's the first thing. Education is really important because you're taken seriously at the level that you are when, when you pursue something and you, you become educated with that, um, as well as try to get as much experience and exposure to the field that you want to go into. Okay, um, Shirley, can you just tell us a bit about your... My name is Shirley Thompson. Um, I'm perhaps known as a composer of orchestral music. I've most recently completed a ballet that's touring uh, 25 countries around the world, including this year Moscow, um, the State um, Opera House, um, uh, New York on Broadway at the City Centre, um, New Zealand at the Opera, Sydney Opera House in New Zealand, in Wellington, um, I think it's the St George's Theatre there. Um, I'm also uh, known for a symphony that I've written and apparently it's the first symphony to have been completed and conducted, composed and conducted by a woman in the last um, 35 years in Europe. I always aspire towards excellence in all the things I do, so if I had decided to become a film director, which is something up until maybe 10 years ago that I was at the, worked at the BBC, I was in line to continue in um, film media, um, I would have excelled in that because I think my, my parents imbued me, especially my mother, with the idea that if you um, try something or want to do something, you give it everything you've got, you give it 200%. So I think um, it's that kind of attitude that has helped me and that attitude that will help anybody, that if you want to do something, you have to give it everything. Um, but having um, two expertise in filmmaking and in writing music, I had studied music, so I decided to pursue, or it's just worked out that I pursued writing music in the 80s against all odds of going to university. 
Um, in fact, when I got to the university, the lecturers were surprised because they said, your teachers had given you a low expectation mark and I achieved um, high, very good A-levels and they had um, written to the university or the expectation on the grade form was much lower than I achieved. So um, you never know what's going on behind in the background as to what your teachers are inferring. And certainly um, when I was growing up in the 70s um, and early 80s when I was at school, um, it wasn't as much, I think it's, it's improved vastly now. Your teachers may not um, give you or um, suggest that you, might, you may not go to university, but certainly you weren't encouraged um, necessarily when I was at school. So it's fortunate that um, I knew friends that had gone to Oxford and Cambridge and I thought if they can do it, I can do it too. <laughs> My name is Dawn Alexander. I, I was born in Trinidad, the beautiful Caribbean island of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, my ancestry comes from uh, Africa. My great grandmother was from the Yoruba nation. My grandfather was from the Hausa nation. Um, and my, my parents' background, my father's father was one of the most eminent headmasters in the Caribbean. My mother was a businesswoman in terms of running poultry farms or beauty salon and, and, and seamstress. And so I come from a background of very supportive, entrepreneurial type of people. After leaving school, I became a laboratory technician, as also worked in housing uh, as well as in finance. And eventually, after my marriage broke down, I decided to set up my business called Grandma's in memory of my loving grandmother to educate people on the ancient traditions as well as how to use God's healing foods for their medicine. My only goal was to show my children that, look, I am going to establish this business, I am going to take it mainstream, I am going to be the best businesswoman I can be because I know I have the best support behind me. All I need you to do is there's going to be so much work because what I'm going to do is going to be so extreme and so rare that there will be times that I'm going to want to give up. If ever I want to give up, I want you to give me the biggest kick up the backside and say, no, you've gone too far, you cannot give up on yourself. And so with their support, my parents' support, my family support, I went forward. I was in three months without any financial support any financial assistance, having no experience in business itself. I designed, packaged, made, and decided to promote my own products. I decided, well, look, I know this is a new, unique product to the world, and it is the best in the world, and therefore it belongs to the best stores in the world. Hence, I thought of Harris. But to be realistic, I thought it would take me at least 10 years understanding business before I can get to Harris. And then one of my grandmother's old saying came into my head, don't give up for tomorrow what you can do today. And I decided, well, the least they can do is say no. The best they can do is say yes. See, for me, success is one and the same coin. You work just as hard to succeed as you do to fail. It just happens that the coin fall on the other side. But in my vocabulary, there's no word as failure. Because if you hadn't tried, you'd have never have failed. So with that, within three months, I had personally negotiated my herbal pepper sources into Harrods and Fort Masons, which instantly became a big national news. But we're paying too much focus on sport and music and entertainment. And we have the ability to do a whole range of other things and we need to do that. Well, I'm probably sitting here because I'm the first black woman that was made a dame in this country. And that was my second public award. I was made an OBE in 1972 for my work in race relations. We got the campaign against, the campaign against racial discrimination, of which I was a key member, got the race relations legislation. And I was also involved with human rights here, which has given us uh, the present Commission for Equality and Human Rights have come together. And so 
that sort of work and being the first black woman governor of the BBC, as well as all the community active activities that I've been involved in. And maybe the thing I'm proudest of is the fact that I was asked by the Inns of Court Law School to chair an inquiry into why black barristers and women barristers were not being successful in their training. And that led to a change after a thousand years of one way of training barristers, a change in the training of barristers. So rather than all of them having to come to London to the Inns of Court Law School to achieve what they want to achieve, they're now able to train in six different parts of the country. I come from a very middle class family in Trinidad. I'm the eldest of a very large family. There are 10 of us, five boys and five girls. There are only eight of us now, one boy and one girl have passed on. And the, I went to a secondary grammar school there, but I also went, first of all, to my grandmother's, my paternal grandmother's private school. The values I have came from my parents and the teachers, um, but particularly from my grandmother, who was my first teacher. And my father always said to me that I could achieve anything that I wanted to achieve. I just had to set about doing it. And also to recognize that sometimes you start things off and you fail, but don't get depressed by the failure. Pick yourself up, dust yourself down, and start all over again. So um, when I met difficulties here, that was the attitude I continued to use. I was helping to run the Caribbean Communications Project and I was training some tutors in Brixton. Got there early and went into Marks and Spencer's and Brixton High Street. And uh, there were six or eight jobs advertised. Went back to my school the next day and applied. And uh, was told when I got there for the 10 o'clock appointment on the Saturday that all the jobs had been filled. I met a great deal of hostility from the person talking to me. I then was able to take out a letter from Lord Seif, who was then the chairman of Marks and Spencers and the major shareholder, which then made her change her tune. And I was then able to use that to encourage her or to demand from her that she fill all her posts with black people because it was a store two thirds filled with black buyers and purchasers, but not any black staff. But previous to that, I had situations where I would be the person who was to see whoever it was with a proper appointment made. When I turned up, the secretary would ask me, am I sure that I'm Jocelyn Barrow? Well, I've known that for a very long time. So you have to learn how you deal with that because if you lose your temper at that stage, whatever it is that you're trying to achieve, you're not going to achieve because they've got the better of you. So no matter how frustrated you get, how angry, how disillusioned, keep your cool. So I think it's important to become immersed in any kind of learning that you can, to become a broader person that you can, because as an artist you draw on all kinds of experiences. I think when I was um, growing up in the East End of London, there were relatively few black people in the schools in the area where I grew up. And I think there was a very uh, limited expectation of you if you were a, a black child. You weren't expected to be academic, you weren't expected uh, to achieve. And indeed, there were very few uh, people, role models in different jobs to enable you to think it may be possible. And so um, when I decided I wanted to be a lawyer, um, I didn't receive a great deal of encouragement, save and an except from my family. For my family, they said that you need to be the arbiter of your own good fortune. And if you work hard, and if you are committed, and if you've correctly identified your talents, there should be no barrier. But that wasn't quite um, how my career's teacher saw it. And I remember that when I told my father that I wanted to be a lawyer, he was actually rather disappointed because he thought I should be a physicist. Um, the whole of my family um, had been encouraged to do science because both my mother, but particularly my father, saw science and technology as the new world. I think it is more subtle than it has ever been on racism. I think it is very subtle, extremely subtle. And um, 
and you have to be mindful that you don't get um, di diverted from the reality of the way in which racism works, you know. Um, it's, uh, I think it is still there. I mean, you listen to the community, people talking from time to time, they say one step forward, two steps backward, you know. And each of us, not being in a workplace now, um, for example, a teacher was telling us very recently that in her school, a lot of the black teachers have had to leave, and the progressive whites are leaving too. Racism, she says quite clearly. One either head, deputy head, was heard saying the children were asked to see the head and they were lining up and she heard a, a responsible teacher saying that though they're standing up for the prison gate. Britain has come a very, very long way. When I came here, black people were at the very bottom of the societal strata. They were in the NHS, they were in transport, they were working in factories. We had very few professionals, even teachers, and that has changed considerably. But it hasn't changed easily. And to say that it has changed and things have improved enormously doesn't mean that we don't still have racism, both covert and overt. But the improvements that we have made, we've had race relations, a race relations act in 65, which didn't really do much because it didn't touch the main areas. The 68 Act was the act that really gave us the right coverage of the areas where discrimination was practiced. <clears throat> Supplementary school movement started with uh, the whole Black Power period, okay? And then we began meeting at Africa First, I think we used to meet at Ghana House, Ghana. And I don't know what happened there, but we went over to the West Indian Student Center. And uh, a number of students and workers um, used to assemble there and we did talked about things that bothered us, put it that way. And um, yeah, indeed it was the Black Pope, because I remember when when Stokely Carmichael came, he spoke at the center, and I can't even tell you who were the people who were organizing this. It just happened. You get a phone call, you have to come down to the center, gone, you know? And, um, and then when Eric Williams came, and we gave him hell, why did you ban Stokely? Because he was a national of Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, the, the pressure was so great, took his hearing aid off. We didn't want to hear anymore. <laughs> so we thought we won, you know. And his uh, lieutenants, when he was prime minister, um, just took him away. But I can't remember how people knew that Stokely was in town. It just went through the, the grapevine. And so we were really meeting at the center and talking about arts and culture and education. Because I could think of a few young people, um, June Doyle, she was June Doyle at the time, Jack Hines, you know, married and as a couple, Ansel Wong. And, and a number of other people. And what we did at the center was apart from the debates that took place, we also, Jake's Compton, Jacques Compton, he's now dead. His brother was the prime minister of St. Lucia. And he taught drumming at the center. And Ansel taught art and drama with the students who came there, wanting somewhere to go, all school.
Colonel Garden was one. Yes. And uh, then there was a young man by the name of Desmond Agard, a teacher, and he was telling us what was going on in the schools and that parents were not quite aware that when they talk about special, they think special as in the Caribbean, you know, and not special meaning downgrading. And women, I believe, also taught in a school in East London. And she told us, and there was a guy who was a head teacher, Horton, something Horton, I can't remember his name, the first name. And he told us about what was happening at the school. So we became, and John LaRose was part of that movement. And, um, and we became very incensed about and trying to warn the parents that when they talk about special, that just means that there's nothing special about our children going to these schools. And at that same time, there was a busing that took place in South Hall, where the children were, well, you know what that means, it went to different areas to the school. So it was a culmination of a whole set of situations taking place in the air, in the field. And we were calling on the governments, but they take no notice of us, of course. So the meeting at the center
Thank you very much, Kwaku. Uh, there's lots of comments in the chat. Uh, it's a superb job you've done, Kwaku. This is from Alexander the Great in interviewing these extraordinary, exceptional women. And it's a, a lot of people are uh, conflicted because some of them are in two meetings and wish they could spend most of their time here. So well done, Kwaku. Um, I, uh, I think that is from uh, Sister Blossom. She says she, she's known and has worked with quite a few of them. Um, and again, people are very impressed with the, the breadth of the interviews. And, and frankly, I love the photography. I thought it was really nice. So thank you so much. Nana, I just want to jump in. I think I saw a Sonia, our counselor Sonia, and she did tell me that she probably has to leave early. Councillor Sonia, I saw you earlier. If you ain't, do you want to unmute? Because we did highlight South London a bit. I see Sister Patsy as well from South London, Croydon area. Sister uh, Councillor Sonia, are you in the room? Sonia Winifield. Yes, I am. Yes, I'm in the okay. room. Thank you, because you did indicate that you may have to leave early. So I just want you to have an opportunity to input because, in fact, I did send an, an article I wrote focusing on the ladies and the South London connection. So uh, do you want to speak to any aspect since I know you, you're from the London borough of Lambeth? Yes, well, uh, just to say thank you because you covered uh, beautifully um, Olive Morris and also uh, Claudia Jones. And um, to say that you, you showed Olive Morris House, of course, you know that Olive Morris House is now being um, demolished but we've um we're working with the olive morris collective that's her family to um uh, to uh, sustain her legacy in lambeth i'm currently leading on the audit of um statues uh, works of art street names with links to slavery and colonialism so we're looking closely at um those um black people men and women in lambeth who've contributed and um, how we can um, maintain their legacy uh, going forward in our, you know, retelling our history or, or re unearthing the truth, as I like to call it. And um, certainly uh, Olive Morris, yeah, a big uh, figure in Lambeth, and I've had some requests for a statue of Olive Morris in uh, Windrush Square. Um, also, um, uh, Claudia Jones, I believe the Lambeth Archives have uh, been in communication with uh, Heritage England about a plaque from Heritage uh, England uh, for um, Claudia Jones. So I think you've, you've covered it all, um, uh, Quaker, but what I would like to add is that um, Lambeth has been, uh, since the 80s, very forward thinking in um, collectively um, uh, keeping alive the, the contributions, uh, the history of our people. And certainly what we've um, unearthed with this audit is around the, the street names very early in the 80s. I mean, some of you will, will remember Louise Bennett. We've got uh, Louise Bennett close uh, in Lambeth. We've, we've also got, um, uh, uh, what, what, um, well, we talked about Olive Morris, we've got um, uh, Louise Bennett, there's um, uh, Ellen Kuzawayo, uh, she was a um, uh, South African member of the, the ANC, South Africa ANC. And um, so a lot of our street names have kept these memories uh, alive, and uh, we certainly intend in doing so. And we, we have um, other people, there is someone else I would like to mention, that's not been mentioned. I'm not sure how um, well known uh, people, but I'm sure people will remember the publication um, Black Heritage Today, uh, which was published by, um, it's, uh, it, it's been, I, I have a copy of it since the, uh, 2007, and it, it's just remarkable that this, um, this is kept uh, going when it did at that time. I remember 
growing up here in, in uh, Brixton. And certainly this is one of the few black, uh, dedicated to black people, the history of black people. It was one of the few magazines available at that time and it was published, the publisher was Barbara Campbell. Her sister worked um, as a counselor, uh, Lorna was a counselor in Lambeth, uh, Lambeth Council. And um, Barbara uh, died uh, in December last year, <laughs> 19. And um, I, I just wanted to mention her because this was a phenomenal uh, woman who did such a great deal for our community uh, back then. And if I may, um, Kwaku, I have to go, but I would like to read, if, if I may, something from her that she, she did, um, one of her, the notes as the editor of the magazine. And this is what she said in this magazine. Uh, this is, so this is from uh, Barbara Campbell, and uh, she won the Women, Woman of Excellence Award in 2007. And this copy um, of uh, Heritage Today, October, November 2007, and this is what she said in her editor's note. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me, but the road to success is not straight. There is a curve called failure, a loop called confusion, speed bumps called friends, red lights called enemies, caution lights called family. You will have flat school jobs, but if you have a spare called determination, an engine called perseverance, insurance called faith, and with a driver called Jesus, you will make it to a place called success. And that was, you know, her, this was just, folks, you know, this was her, this was Barbara. So I just wanted to leave you with that, to this phenomenal woman who I think it sometimes she's forgotten. So I wanted to bring her here to be reminded that she does live on and um, she certainly lives on for me because as I said, this was one of the few black uh, ma uh, magazines dedicated to black people. And given what we're experiencing today with the Black Lives Matter, the same conversations we're having now were covered in this magazine in 2007. And it's just, you know, it, it's, it's just questions how how can we continue <laughs> having the same conversations? And um, when will there be a, a, some sort of um, a, a, a reckoning, a, 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 a something that we can say, well, this is now, that was then, this is now, but we continue with having the same conversations over and over again. And um, she was, uh, as I say, uh, addressing these issues even then. Right. Okay. Thanks a lot, Councillor Winifred. Two things, one quick question and one quick comment. There is indeed a Claudia Jones Way in Lambeth. Near yes, there Westfield. is. Yes, there Correct. is. Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. Claudia Jones Way. And I mean, we, 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 uh, and we have got Mary Seacole House uh, in Lambeth. I mean, it's, it's uh, in uh, Clapham. It was uh, part, it, well, it is part of the Clapham Library, but certainly yes. um, uh, Mary Seacole House. Right there. Right. Okay. Secondly, I know people like Devon were fighting to keep our, uh, what's the name, Oliver Morris's name on the building. So what is the deal with the redevelopment? Is her name going to be stuck on the new building coming up? No, her name won't be stuck on the new building coming up because uh, Olive Morris was for social housing, which is very much about um, a community. So this building will be, there will be, um, uh, what they call what the term um, affordable housing, but I think her family are keen for her name, her legacy, to be um, erected somewhere else. I think I've had some um, uh, communication with them, and they've suggested our civic centre being named uh, Olive Morris. But I am I, I am confident, Quaker, that um, her legacy will live on we will definitely um, find a, a building. She will be commemorated again. But I'm also told that the, the building, the construction, there will, there will be a plaque on the cornerstone of the building uh, to commemorate her. But the, the lettering, Olive Morris, um, we will place uh, on another building. And we're in, in conversation. And I think it's, it's timely 
in the sense that we're now having this, um, the audit, which uh, of statues, monuments um, and street names, we will be holding this, it's a, uh, it will be community consultation, There's, there will also be uh, online consultations, two community engagement uh, programs people can log on to and be part of the conversation. Those dates have yet to be announced, but we will be doing that. So, Olive Morris, um, all the suggestions people are putting forward for various names people want to see commemorated, but it's very much a community um, discussion and how we go forward. But yes, Olive Morris, her legacy will live on in Lambeth. Most Thank you. Definitely. Sorry. Thank you very much, Councillor Winfred. Have a good day and thanks for your, your input. It's, it's been quite useful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. No, no, bye bye. I, but I'll pick up a couple of people, then I will hand over to you. Uh, Yana, I'm not sure if you're having problems with your machine. Yana has left. Okay, that she's still showing her mind, so I don't know if okay, it's someone else. Yana, I am still here, but I, okay. I do have a machine. Yeah, so that's why I'm jumping to you. It's okay. About it's about 10 years since uh, that video was done, if not more. I'm sure your hairstyle is changed for a start. Do yeah. you, do you, you want, do you want to give a personal reflection 10 years on as to what you are saying or take it from any angle? I do. Thank you so much again. And when you interviewed me the first time, it was, you know, it was one of those things where you're up and coming and you're rising and I'm doing it at the time out of necessity. Now, I had watched my father, who the house in Birmingham that my father built, along with uh, 12 other black men, is up for a blue plaque award. So 12 men built half of the street. So I grew up watching my father uh, pioneer. So I didn't know that everybody didn't do that. I didn't know that that was unusual. Mm -hmm. So like the other women who said they had uh, discouragement. I had the discouragement, but I would go home and see my mom do excellent things. And I would see my father, we would play in the foundations of these houses as they had been risen. And it was a scheme that was uh, put together by Akafest Foundation for self-build, uh, to bring people out of uh, that uh, situation, economic empowerment it was. And so even today, when we look at all the agendas that have risen up, my thing is economic empowerment. And if you have the ability, you can literally take yourselves out of that by going off and pioneering and doing something, fulfilling the needs within your community. Like Dame uh, Justin said, what can we do? What have we got to give? That is usually the solution and the answer. And so just looking back all these years and recognizing, wow, my father, they did something amazing. Everybody didn't do this. And even to this day, moving to Texas and coming to Houston, again, I've come in a new region, new people, new challenges, and I am looking around at what can I do? What have I got to give? Oh, Yana, thank you very much first for your prayer. And I'm glad you could stay long enough to give a personal insight. So this is history, but history from a different perspective. The type yeah. you probably wouldn't find in a book. Because these are personal uh, reflections. You probably ain't going to see in the book. So thank you very much, y Yana, and to your family my, as well. My thank pleasure. And sorry that I have to go. We've got a six hour difference. It's still <laughs> So I just bless everybody <laughs> online and thank you again. And I'd just love to keep in touch with you and anything that you're doing or broadcasting. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thanks. So thank now, you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'll do bye. two and then I will hand over to you. And Eve, I can see you out there. I will call you because obviously we highlighted your mom. But Blossom, I, uh, I, I could see you because you had the video on att paying attentive, uh, <laughs> attentively to what was going on, especially uh, quite animated when you saw people you knew. So maybe you can give your personal take on some of the guys you knew. On, uh, yeah, so over to you, Blossom. Um, do you want me to, to do Dame Jocelyn now? Because um, um, I've known Barbara, uh, Dwayne Alexander, uh, uh, Cecilia uh, Briga was on our committee for the bronze woman. Um, okay, this how uh, this how we're gonna play. Hold on, Pardon? this how we're gonna play. I'm going to give you a limited time, and you can feel it as you, you want to. If it's one so person, you want me to do so, Jocelyn now. No, no, hold on, hold on. This how we're gonna play. 
I'm going to give you four minutes and you can capture as many people as you want to. So that's your four minutes. Go ahead. Okay, I'll start with Jocelyn because I wasn't just sure about the format that this would take. And, and so I will just talk briefly about Jocelyn. I, I met her in 1972 when I was senior nursing officer in Camden and was lead of the, the new modular system of training for nurses where um, nurses would do their community experience. And all the education and training was done in eight weeks for students from UCH, Royal Free, and the Elizabeth Garrett Anderson. And Jocelyn used to teach on that course uh, uh, on race relations. And I can still see her erudite explanation and delivery, which made me proud. And secondly, I was also on the North Kensington Family Center, headed by, uh, name is Kate, we <laughs> come back, but she was the chairman. And um, two of the things that we did there, uh, um, they looked after the education and training skills for young people, but it was there that the wonderful world of Mrs. Seacole was launched at one of the events. And we had the annual trip to Mary Seacole's grave for the service. And uh, so that's um, uh, Jessica. And as far as Barbara is concerned, she was on the board of, uh, she was one of the journalists on the Voice newspaper when I ran my column and bookends featuring books written by black and Asian authors in a fortnightly program. And I was shocked just now to hear that she had died because she's mm. much younger than me. I think my four minutes is up, is it? No, no, I'll give you one more minute. You're doing well. And, um, and Cecile Nabriga, um, I, 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 I'm so glad that that statue was made because um, I was on her committee and it was, I, you know, she was a skilled performer. I sold many of her books, Bronze Woman, and I'm glad that, you know, that was the outcome of her marvelous book. And if you hadn't heard her delivery and you can find it anywhere, it's something that you could feature. Thank you for this privilege, Quarker. You have done very well. No, thank you, Blossom, for adding, because obviously, there are some people I knew personally, but for most, it's what I read and, and stuff. So it's always useful to have some personal context to, to that story. So on that note, uh, Eve, if you want to unwind, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, unmute, because obviously uh, we, we mentioned Cecil uh, Nebruga, but you are family, so probably you can bring a perspective that we're not aware of. So go ahead, Eve. Is that okay for you? Thank you very much for, for um, inviting me on the um, on your you know a very very esteemed um, panel um, with um, what with Baroness Baroness um, Scotland. Ah, uh, Scotland, of course. Um, who it so happened to unveil the bronze woman statue is one of those who was at present in two thousand eight unveiling the statue. Um, and once again, um, congratulations on your work, Kwaku. Um, long may it continue. Okay. Uh, I don't think I'm going to do as much, as much as four minutes, but I did want to, um, yes, to, to say that it was marvelous to see the, your mention, your bit on the bronze woman. I'm just holding up one of the programs of, of, um, an anniversary of 2000. 18, I think it might have been two years ago. Yeah, because, it was. Um, of course, uh, we couldn't have anything this year because of the COVID. But um, but then there's there's a picture of the lady herself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one of one of several. But um, <laughs> but thank you again. And um, and we do we do want to keep it um, in people's minds. And that, and of course, for the. For the younger generation coming through, we, we must make it prominent to them and much mm. more publicity is needed. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, because... Uh, and thank you, thank you, Blossom. I, I've, no, I've heard your name 
mentioned several times and and from my mother in the past, but I don't think I've ever met you or, or perhaps so apologies. But um quite too well done. No, no, no. I'm glad I'm glad at least a family member could join us. Nana and I were at the twenty eighteen meeting. So in fact, that's where I, I took the shots from. Oh uh, so All right, yes. Excellent. And it's every October except for this year because but did you say you went there? Did you say you went there? I, I did indeed. I, I dragged a friend who was very interested and keen on the on you know getting the thing promoted. So we were there on the day itself, which yeah. <laughs> sadly just just a pair of us. But she's very um enthusiastic about the program. Right. Well, no. for the, well, for the educating the the future generations and all in our history of, of obviously. Right. Now, since I, I've got you, can you tell us a bit about her composition? Because I hear she was a classical composer as well. Oh, my I know, goodness. I, 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 know played, I know she played <laughs> the a, piano. Of course, she did. She composed and won several prizes in, um, yeah. in the British Guiana uh, those days. <coughs> Music festivals we would have every um, an annual every year. And she did her compositions and she actually played and performed in well competitions of of uh mm -hmm. and um won several prizes and um she did actually do it duetted with her mother um who was a, a brilliant um pianist as well my grandmother who was um of the name bergen so that's where my mother's <laughs> all her, her talents well on the piano and everything but uh, as well as um Speaking well, spoken word. She did verse as well. Okay. Just speaking. Oh, so, so this is this is um an honor. I'm I'm very um I'm very honored that I've been involved. <laughs> well, no, I'm mean, a little bit. We we're glad that you could join us. So but, we, yes, but the thing is, um, sorry, Quacko, but the the thing is, my mother was so they're so multifaceted. Yes, indeed. Um, because she, I. Re, I was asking my brother the other day, Bruce, and I think you, you would know him. Yes. Um, my mother took part in an annual sort of a Christmas <coughs> um, short story writing in Guyana, British Guyana then. Um, one of our major newspapers, that sort of, I think it was called the Daily Chronicle. And they, they published, and she won several prizes over the years for her short stories. That, but this is... Um, or what is something I have to pursue with the with the people in Georgetown, where <laughs> so if if they have a, a good archive, if we could um, find some of those stories and um, get them back again, well, that would be, be good. I hope that happens. Yeah. So obviously, multifaceted. We know her as a poet, obviously because of the bronze woman, but she was an educator, as we just found out, a pianist, a composer. Thank you very much, Eve, for giving us a personal uh, perspective. Oh, you're, you're more than welcome, and thank you for asking me. Right. <laughs> so on that, on that note, I'll hand over to Nana, you. so you can see who yeah. wants to contribute. This is the format. It's if you, you. you can either ask a question, thank you, ma make can a I, comment. Can I disappear from the screen? <laughs> you, you're more than welcome to. You, you can see as long as you want to. You can disappear. Oh, yes. Okay, I'll go down. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, no, no. Well, um, I hope you all are in, uh, ready for maybe a discussion uh, to give your reactions. I've read some of the reactions in the chat and I know that uh, all of us are fascinated by Kwaku's work, but more than that, it's the women themselves. They have so much to teach us. I mean, we just heard about uh, Cecil Nobrega and her multifaceted, you know, very talented woman, but then again, there's more of that around. And I think this is also about encouraging people to look at themselves and not limit their light. Um, we heard from Baroness Scotland uh, in the film, remember her, her saying that failure is, there's no shame in failure. There's shame in not trying and discovering your gift is the important thing. Right. Um, <laughs> I'd like people to think about uh, what parents told them and when I say parents, I'm thinking in the African sense, a parent is not necessarily your blood parents. We say it takes a village to raise a child, but what words of encouragement or what words like Baroness Scotland said in her family, 
there was no fit shame in failure, but the only shame was in not trying. And if you can all think of things that you were told, you know, these phrases that we remember from our parents, and like I said, think laterally in terms of parents, a little wider than just uh, mother, father, nuclear family, but in the African sense, mm-hmm. the village, things that you heard growing up. Sister Blossom, can you uh, come in? Yes. Um, first of all, it was quite nice to see Baroness Scotland. The last time I saw her was at the reception following the Jasmine Beckford inquiry, where um, a colleague of mine, Pat Marshall, was the nurse on that inquiry. And the book that followed was A Child in Trust that led to legislation. So I was, that was the first and only time. And I've watched her progress and also seen how she has changed since those times, since that reception so many years ago. Okay. Yes. As far um, as parents are concerned, my father's mo- uh, message to me was, don't try to be better than anyone else, but be the best that you can be. Yeah, be the best you can be. Well, that's very wise words. Really <laughs> wise words. Does anybody else have something, some gem to share with us that parents said? You know, some things that they used to say that maybe growing up you found irritating, but you found that they were wise after all <laughs> as you grew up. You know, because the French have a saying, si jeunesse pouvait, si, uh, si jeunesse savait, si vieillesse pouvait. That is, young people, if only they knew. And when you're older, if only you could, because you don't have the same energy as you did when you were younger. But, you know, the wisdom comes and you wish you could do the things of youth. So are there any wise words? So um, I'll open it up. I want to know what people have to say, what comments, what contributions, you know, because it is always interesting to find out what other people think and how other people receive the same material. We've heard about those who passed, like Claudia Jones, uh, Olive Morris. And for some people, maybe the memory of who Olive Morris was may have passed, but it's a reminder of who this woman was, who this activist who cared about the homeless, who cared about the, you know, recycling the, the pound and have the Brixton pound and, you know, empowering people. So I sort of, I want to see if either you raise your hand, use the electronic hand, or you can put your question in the chat and I'll pick it up and ask you to speak. Um, for example, I know we've got Councillor Patsy Cummings. Are you in the house? Yes, uh-huh. I am in the house. Uh, so please, could, uh, can I give you, I know I've put you on the spot because you haven't <laughs> raised your hand, but since you're here, it'd be really a pleasure for you to tell us what your reaction to what you saw. And first of all, start by telling us a little bit about yourself, which borough do you represent, um, which ward, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. And uh, Kweku, um, I take and doff my cap. Well done. Thank you um, I think the work you've been doing, not just on this, but you've been working tirelessly for so many years and you actually um, keep our feet to the fire when we're not actually taking forward the mantle. And I know you've done that to me and others. So keep um, pushing us to do the right thing. Thank you. Uh, my name's Patsy Cummings. I'm a councillor in Croydon. Uh, my ward is South Norwood. Um, and the film uh, that I saw that Quaker's put together is absolutely great. It's showing us um, that not just people from the past, but our contemporary heroes are here and are around us. And young people need to know that and see that in front of us, in front of them, so they can see that there are role models in front of them. It's just, we need to bring it out into the open. Um, and I think with Black Lives Matter and the way in which we are trying to now uh, be taken seriously about changing the curriculum. It's not about black history being British history. It's about black history and science and literature. And it's absolutely everything. We should be in every part of the curriculum. So I'm really proud of the work that people like Kweku and lots of others have been doing. Um, so, I, and obviously some of the people that are in the film that you produced, I have either met them or know them um and i just take my hat off to them all because 
it's not just past ancestors whose shoulders we stand on, it's the, the current ones as well. Mm. Um, and I know it was a lot of women that was included in, mm. in that, but I just don't want to forget the men as well. So oh, in, yes. in, Croydon, in Croydon, we have Samuel Coleridge Taylor, who um, was in Croydon. He was actually in my ward in South Norwood. Oh. And that was someone who was born in 1875. So we've been here a long time. Our youngsters need to know that. And he died in 1912. He was a composer uh, and he... Uh, must have faced the things that we face today, but even worse, he wasn't recognized. Um, but he has a legacy here in Croydon. We need to celebrate him. And so there's lots that we do in Croydon. And we've got the Samuel Coleridge Taylor Center, which is a youth provision, which we want to make sure our young people recognize who he was and youth are uh, do a lot in that particular center. And I'd also like to just mention that um, at the Crystal Palace Bowl, uh, the venue where Bob Marley debuted Redemption Song 40 years ago have just placed a plaque in his Indeed. honour. And that that's just that. that's brilliant. Happened. That's brilliant. So um, that's Bob Marley. I mean, he died 11 months after that. And so I think it was the venue where Bob Marley played his last and biggest concert in the UK. Uh, and so we've, a plaque's been raised and you've been, um, uh, Exactly. Yeah, yeah. An article yeah. about it. So thank you for that. That is brilliant. Yeah. Nana, so can I come in, please? Nana, can I come in, please? Thank you very much, uh, Patsy. I'm really glad that you, you could join us. Uh, we only do women this time around because the library thought it wanted to do that. That's what we're doing. But in my film, where I took uh, the, what is it, for example, the Olive Morris, Summer Crutella is mentioned, I, I, he, 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 he what should I say, fell ill at West Croydon Station. I filmed that old posse is the old ship. I think it's called the old ship or fool's ship, something like that. Pap, there, there's an image of some of Crutella in there. I've got that. I filmed, uh, there, there's, a, there's a silhouette. There's a silhouette of some of Crutella. The three, he's one of the three favorite sons and, and daughters of, of Croydon. So I have filmed, so I have covered some of Crutella but for another opportunity. And can I just say that uh, Mr. A.A.D., uh, what's his name, Alexander the Great, has got a video dedication to, uh, to Dame Joycelyn. So at some time, maybe quarter past, Nana, I would like to show it since uh, he's here. So he, he may speak to it as well. Thank you very much. <coughs> okay, so Alexander the Great, it's good that you're here and you've got your film. So I'll watch the time and make sure that we, ha we make time for that. I noticed Dr. Velma in the house. So Dr. Velma, do you, I know you missed the film. Including but, um, herself, she was in, by the bronze woman. She missed that. Yeah, oh. the picture of you by the bronze woman with uh, Don Buck. Really? <laughs> oh. So you're missing yourself. But <laughs> anyway, and sorry you couldn't uh, get in when you wanted to, but I'm glad you're here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, do you want me to say a quick word? Uh, do you have, uh, if you can do it in 30 seconds, that is fine. Then I can go around the room to the rest. Oh. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I am thrilled to be here. Sorry I missed the video because I really would have, I know it's 30 seconds. I would have liked to have said um, something about Dame Jocelyn Burroughs which happened at Westminster. It's not the Central Hall. I was there, bro, Krakow, when you did the film. You showed the film. Yes, and yes. So I do have a wonderful memory of her, but I'll have to share it later cool. if there is space. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And I'm in Pearly, Councillor Cummins. I'm in Pearly, so check your chat, please. <laughs> I will, thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, it's good you're here. Nice to see you. Um, does anybody have a question or a comment? Because, again, Kwaku is a fount of knowledge. You know, when he goes around doing these interviews, he has these anecdotes that don't make it onto the film, but a lot of stories. And as uh, he pointed out, the reason why he did um, the DVD on women was that the project, the original project that he had done, the NAM project, was looking at male role models. 
Because often people said, oh, the reason why we have problems is that there are no male role models. And then, of course, rightly, there was a reaction that where are the women? So he had this book and DVD all focused on men, not because he didn't think there were women, but because that was what the project was. So because of this um, request from the public, uh, Kwaku then came up with what they said I should be and decided to interview several women, several African women who had achieved and people who we might not know about except people like uh, Sister Blossom, you knew them because you worked with them. But a lot of people, we wouldn't know about them. We wouldn't know that they're women who are composers, women who are in business. Yes, we might have heard of Duna Alexander because of her grandma's pepper sauce. Yes. <laughs> the shops. But what the service that Kwaku did for us was to bring out these stories. And the most fascinating one for me was um, the, attorney general, the former Attorney General, Baron of Scotland. Yeah. And that um, story about how she was told that if she, she applied herself, she could become a uh, supervisor in Sainsbury's. Uh, <laughs> obviously, her career as advisor didn't know that they had a powerhouse of a woman, an intelligent, versatile. I mean, she was the first woman of any race to make it as attorney general. And that yeah. is quite a feat. So what I want to hear from you is what do you, what comments do you have? And I have a quote which I'm sure, again, from a woman, and it comes from African Voices, and it's Corrector Scott King, the, uh, who was a widow of Martin Luther King, and she said, struggle is a never-ending process. Freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it in every generation. And the reason I like that quote is that it reminds us that the battle is not just won and then finished, you sit down. It's about us having to do our bit, We've seen what others have done. We stand on the shoulders of giants because what mm -hmm. Dame Jocelyn did with CARD allowed the Race Relations Act and other things to come. It allowed other people to do things. What she did with Marks and Spencer. You know, mm -hmm. some of us take it for granted that you walk into Marks and Spencer and you see Asians and Africans behind the till. That wasn't always the case. We were not behind the till. We were okay to clean, but not to spell, not to be, you know, salespersons. So mm -hmm. I want to know what you think uh, in your own struggles, in your own journeys, what have you picked up from tonight's film that you can share and say, ah, that resonates with me? Because earlier on when I asked the question about what uh, sayings you had, I noticed a few people shared what their mothers said or what, um, you know, or what they were told growing up. So sort of, this is your space. So if you can indicate if you've got something to contribute, I'll call you and then we can hear your contribution. Uh, my take is I'm very uh, grateful that uh, Kwaku did this because I wouldn't have known about all these amazing women, amazing examples of African greatness, wherever they are, if, I, if you hadn't have shown me, because I have to go and pick through so much research and websites, but it's much better to hear it from you than it is from a sort of website or from a book that won't put it in. So for me, it's empowering. For me, it's stuff my mum can't tell me anymore because she's not very well. And it's very, very important that this keeps on going. And it's just empowering for me. It's empowering. It makes me feel very, 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 very proud. And it also means that I haven't got any excuses to give up. <laughs> That's what it means to me. Oh, is that good? Yeah. Yeah. You're always good. I've got to make my mum proud, you know that. Uh, definitely very, very good. So like, uh, I know, uh, for example, I know that Baroness uh, Scotland said, the only shame is, is not trying. There's no shame in failure. Um, Philomena in the chat, she put a comment from her mum. Uh, and it was, you have to have the courage of your convictions. And I thought that was a powerful one. And it's about, you know, it's those little voices we need to put in our head to keep us trying and to keep us persevering. And I do remember, I don't know if all of you saw on the, or can remember from the film, Dame Joycelyn, at one stage, she talked about the impact. You know, when you're facing Afrophobia, like when she walked into the shop and they're being rude, you know, the microaggressions. And her word of wisdom was, don't lose your cool. Because yeah. when you lose your temper, then you've lost the, the fight, as it were, because that becomes the issue. The fact that you lost your temper, you said X, Y, Z. And she talked about being calm. And it's not easy, 
but it's just advice. It's like a voice needs to go in your head and say, look, mm -hmm. just calm down. You know, that is happening. You're not imagining it. It's not paranoia, but deal with it by winning the fight. Yes. So is there anybody who has a contribution either from their own experience or a question that maybe Kwaku can answer about some of the things that he didn't put in the film, but came out in his conversations with these amazing women. Can I just say, just remind me, uh, it's a shame a couple of people have gone, including people who've been writing about Claudia Jones. But after we play uh, Alexander the Great's uh, track, I want to say a few things about Claudia Jones in particular that are misinformation. And yeah, so remind me after that. Okay. Um, it doesn't seem like people, maybe people are still mulling around in their heads about uh, the films because they were very powerful films. So could I suggest that maybe we show the film that uh, Alexander okay. the Great has and okay. then, we, uh, then you open up the discussion again. Maybe by then people will have questions or comments. Right. Um, before you do that, I have a question. Okay, who has a question? Patricia. Oh, fantastic, Patricia. Please ask. So I wasn't clear because I heard people saying that Kwaku interviewed all these women. Is that what happened or is it that he just collected clips of interviews maybe that other people did? My dear, Kwaku, over to you. My dear Patricia, I have a habit of actually taking clips uh, to create new videos uh, for my programs. For example, the events I'm doing in November, they're not particularly original things. I would go online and research and, and put something together that speaks to the topic. But in this particular case, they were all original footage. The reason being that this was commissioned by the library and as a statutory body, they don't want to have any copyright issues. So they are first thing, question to me was that, do you have any uh, stuff that you own the copyright to? So everything you saw was stuff that actually filmed or photographed. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, great. and I'll add that I think I went on some of the interviews with you. Um, I remember going to the House of Commons when you interviewed Don Butler. Oh, okay. <laughs> was there when you interviewed um, Baroness Scotland. So, yeah, these are all original <laughs> interviews. But who ah. went there physically and interviewed the um, interviewees. Thank right. you. I actually did say, uh, Yana, I went to Yana's uh, house and it's somewhere South London. Now. I'm not great with any, anywhere past Brixton, I, I guess. But that reminds me, let me give you another anecdote. And these are interesting because at the time, you know, I found them written. Since you mentioned Baron in Scotland, once we had our sort of uh, wish list, we emailed to say, we want to interview you. I remember that I'm not a well-known person, certainly not 10, 12 years ago. And we got a curious reply from uh, Baron of Scotland's secretary. She said, because I use the, the terminology, uh, the film is about British Afghan women. Although that time I used to do the other way around, Afghan British women. And she said, you do know she's not African. And I said, she's African. And obviously she didn't make the film, <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not gonna do this sort of Caribbean thing. Obviously I'm not denying people their Caribbean heritage, but I'm saying African covers everyone of African heritage, whether you're from, no matter your antecedents, whether you're from the Caribbean, uh, Britain mm -hmm. or Africa. So I, I loved it that she came along in, irrespective of, I'm sure probably it wasn't her who thought of it, but it was the secretary. I think she was a European trying to uh, make sure that she's been filmed for the right purpose. Having said that, let me remind you, one day, uh, many years ago, the RAF was doing a program called, I think, Airmen of the Caribbean. So this, the research for me, because again, I have filmed uh, Paul Stevenson a couple of times. We've been to Brixton about twice to film him for different projects. So they called me to get his contacts. And I said, you do realize it's not of Caribbean heritage because the first time we, 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 we brought him to London, that was to Harrow. In fact, I think we brought him to Harrow maybe twice. This lady making the introduction went off script and said, oh yes, Paul Stevens always impressed me. One of our great uh, Caribbean heroes. And I had to explain later that Paul Stevenson is of Af continental African because 
his, his father comes from West Africa. He's not sure whether it's from the Gold Coast or from Sierra Leone, but all he knows oh. is that his father comes from West Africa. And the, the, I'm, I'm, I'm an oh. 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 I'm <laughs> Okay, but his mother, although they've got African heritage, they've been in England for like a century or so. They've 200 been, years. Well, there you go. And in fact, I think he had the pleasure of telling one of our politicians that he's more British than them. He calls himself an Englishman. I think his, his, his uh, biography is something of an Englishman. I wouldn't yeah. go that far. I think you can call yourself British, but I'm not quite sure you can call yourself European or, or English. But anyway, I think I, I, I've given the anecdote. So let me just play. Uh, All right. So I, Alexander, I, while we are waiting for Kwaku to find the video, can you just give us a brief thing about it? And OK. Um, in last November, um, I was asked to, um, to, well, I, I was asked to attend uh, what you call it, an event for Dame Jocelyn. I think it was in Canada House. Or I can't remember one of the one of the one of the places no, around no. There, Trafalgar what, Square. What, no, no, it was South Africa House. That was South a, Africa House. You're right. You're right. South Africa House. Her ninetieth birthday. Her ninetieth birthday. You're right. And the uh, great Tobago Crusoe and um, Alberto and I were all there, but I was the only one who wrote a song for her because this is what I do, and Kwaku knows that. I see myself as someone who is um, a bit of a journalist, really, or a griot. My job is just to record the exploits of some of our greatest heroes and sheroes and put them into four verses with a chorus. So it's a potted history, if you like, of, of our people. And in fact, I have to thank the BBC for that because back in 2000, um, my wonderful manager who sadly um, died quite a few years ago, he was diabetic. He went to BBC London and he said, why don't we recreate um, Cy Grant? For those of you who remember Cy mm, Grant. Yeah. On, on, yeah, okay, so you remember Cy Grant. And, and the BBC said, sure, um, but we won't do it on TV. We can't afford, we, we, we haven't got that. We'll let you do it on radio. And it lasted 12 years. And I have to tell you, the fees I got were enormous. I got 35 pounds per song. And I wrote a song every week <laughs> for 12 years about some aspect of um, something that was happening in the news uh, that was uh, you know, of interest to African, people of African heritage. So it was a great grounding and it was a training ground for me so that now I, I knock these off. In fact, uh, I did a couple just last week. I've got another one to do tomorrow. <laughs> this is for my own pleasure, but it, it's, I love doing them because um, it keeps my brain going. And also it means that there is a traditional way of keeping our history, which goes back thousands of years. Because before there was writing, there was song and poetry and memory. That's so, true. This is for James, Dame Jocelyn. You, you, have you found it now? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 okay. I'm okay. So we, Thank you. We should be fine. So that's the background to this. Modern day Grio. Indeed. Thank you. <laughs> the eldest of 14 siblings, you felt a duty to improve the lives of those with less opportunity. Becoming a campaigner for racial equality earned you the reputation of being somewhat feisty we can achieve more you said if we work collectively people in britain are not aware of our history dame jocelyn we always believe in you the things you would do have helped us to get through Dame Jocelyn, we all want to say thank you for staying so steadfast and true. You were supportive of the West Indian Federation, later becoming part of the Windrush generation, facing emotional and physical discrimination. You launched a project called Caribbean Communication. Prepare to meet enough power for a TV conversation. But that cowardly racist just refused the invitation. Dame Jocelyn, we always believe in you. The things you would do have helped us to get through. Dame 
jostling, we all want to say thank you for staying so steadfast and true. 1964 found you at a round table meeting. A life changing day because you met Martin Luther King. Giving you the strength to keep on doing your campaigning. From those days to the Windrush scandal, which is still ongoing. Among numerous awards for the changes you have to bring. You received a DBE for contributions to broadcasting. Dame Jocelyn, we always believe in you. The things you would do have helped us to get through. Dame Jocelyn, we all want to say thank you for staying so steadfast and true. For staying so steadfast and true. Rest in eternal peace, Dame Jocelyn Barrow. Wow, thank you very much. Yeah, and I, 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 I recorded it, actually, when I sang it for her in November. Of course, she passed in April, and when she passed in April, that's when I decided to just film it and, and you know, make it available on Facebook because a lot of people were sending in their, their um, you know, their, their various um, comments and things. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. No, I hope you enjoyed fine. it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we did. Thank you very much. Thank you. Much. Let's see how many myths are what well, Claudia Jones misinformation or factoids I can I, I, I can blow out. Okay? So okay. I, I'll just say to you, you number them. I don't know how many all right, all right. I can. Right. First of all, Claudia Jones did not go to America with her family. Her parents went before her. So I'm gonna mix Claudia Jones with uh, the West Indian Gazette. The West Indian Gazette was never a weekly paper. It was monthly. In fact, often they missed their rounds because of frequency, because of lack of uh, funding. <laughs> there, I'll give myself a chance. There, there's so what many. What about the Notting Hill Carnival? Yeah, okay. You would notice in the video that uh, I, one of the plaques says she was the mother of Notting Hill Carnival, and I questioned that. And um, the first time, and Nana uh, used to live in Harrow, and she, she was a, a great supporter of the African history programs we used to do there. And at one time, we got a very loyal family that used to come regularly, both father and mother and the children. And when I raised the fact that Claudia Jones did not start Carnival, these were normally very nice uh, people, I had to keep quiet if I didn't want to spoil the relationship, but now I think it's important to, to put it out there. Mm. What I can concede to is Claudia Jones being the mother of Caribbean Carnival, because that's what, how they described it. It was described as a West Indian Gazette, West, sorry, um, Caribbean Carnival. Not the Notting Hill, because Notting Hill Carnival started after Claudia Jones died. And it's amazing that uh, Carnival started in living memory and people are confused about when it started. I saw a video and it, it, it was actually investigating this, uh, a 30-minute 30, 30 video done by Wim Baptist. His father was one of the directors of the Notting Hill uh, Carnival, uh, I think in, in, in the 70s. One of the people said, for sure, it was 1964. One said 65. Look, my point is this, uh, so whatever the case, it happened after Claudia Jones died because the evidence that we have, looking at the local newspaper, is 1966. And you see, if they say that Ron Laslett was the person that invited um, all these Caribbean, uh, the, sorry, the Calisonians, Ron, Ron Lancelot started Hair Carnival in 1966. So it's a problem, especially when you have plaques talking to 64. In fact, there was one plaque that was taken <laughs> off because I think it, it had it, that it started in 1964. So yes, uh, Claudia Jones definitely 
the mother of Caribbean carnival, but not of Notting Hill carnival. Mm. And can I just say something as well? No, no, chuck that down. The West Indian Gazette's Caribbean carnival of 1959 was not the first Caribbean carnival in England or London. No. There was one in 55 at the, uh, the Royal Albert Hall of all places. And one of the people that played on it is still alive, Alan Wilmot. Alan Wilmot was part of a group called the Soundland, Southlanders. Yes. A trio. Yes. I am a mole and I live in a hole. There you go. That was their big hit. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Indeed. And he performed at both carnivals. The, in fact, funny enough, oh. that carnival, oh. look, oh. I, I, since I'm writing a book, I've got to be uh, precious how much I give up. <laughs> no, but that carnival was actually uh, organized by a guy called Hugh Scotland. You'd have thought of a name like Hugh Scotland, he was European, but he was an African Caribbean chap. He never lived in uh, West London. She didn't. Uh, she operated uh, the newspaper, the West Indian Gazette from South London, Brixton. 250 bricks in. But there's another one you, you can put down, Nana. The paper was not always there. It was not there when she died. The paper actually moved. It moved to Loughborough, Loughborough Garden uh, Junction, which is just about half a mile from the same place. Station Avenue, I do believe. And then it ended up in North London because uh, her, her partner, Mummy, lived in where. Actually, Claudia Jones lived in North London. She died there, so they moved the paper uh, there. Why don't you spend this five minutes tell, uh, just throwing out uh, things about either Claudia Jones or the West Indian Gazette, and then I'll say right or wrong. Okay, I've got one. One of the things, uh, rather than right or wrong, you, you put up, there was something in the film. You said the West Indian Gazette was not the first yes. African paper. Yes. So, that, that's, you said, is it, which, uh, what was the first African paper and... Okay, I think we've got to be mindful of, 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 of the first. And also what we describe, what we mean by papers, what's his name? S.I. Martin did a very good program for the National Archive and he may be online just about two weeks ago. And he looked at our papers from the 18th century to 1948. So I would say those were more journals than magazines. But let me tell you for a fact, one newspaper that I saw of my own eyes, and it was by one of the veterans. I, he came to fight in the war, and he died about two, three years ago. It was called Philport. Philport. Uh, when he, he settled in Notting, Nottingham, but then came to London, his, magazine, his newspaper was called Colonial News, and that was 1955, 56. I've got a copy of, of it. So I, I can categorically say that there at least there was one paper, that newspaper that I know of, uh, that went before the, the uh, Crazy Jones paper, yes. Oh, thank you. Thank so you at least much. you know that there was the Colonial News before yeah. the yes. end of that. Yeah. Uh, if I can get, whilst we're talking, if uh, it's on my machine, I will, I will, I will get a, a copy. But please just ask me the questions because I think, you know, this is not a, a, a linear conversation. So uh, I've got so much in my head, but it's about responding. So I, okay. I like that. Yes. May I just um, try and clarify a little bit about the, the and I laugh at this because it's so typical of us as Caribbeans that we have three different years when Notting Hill Carnival started. I don't mean, <laughs> it's very typical. No, this is the, this is the backstory. First of all, um, Ishmael Blagro has written a brilliant book yep. uh, that was edited also by um, Margaret, wonderful Margaret Busby. But he pretty much gets the facts right. What happened in 1964, Ronnie Laslett ran a children's kind of center in a house, I think off Tavistock Square or Tavistock Crescent or something. And um, Russell Henderson's Steel Pan Trio was asked to go and play at the party, which they did. And at a certain point, having been there for a while, they said, oh, come on, let me make a turn, which is what Trinidadians say when they mean let's go around the block. So the little trio went out and played around, I think it was um, Power Square or the, the, the area around there. It's supposed and to have been Tavistock. But it's supposed but, to yeah, but Tavistock, Tavistock. Is, is a crazy, yeah, but Power Square is in front of the tabernacle. So they, they did their little turn, they came out of the house went down the road, went around, I think, Tavistock Square and came back around the other way to, to end up back in Tavistock. 
and all it was that some people followed them. That's all it was. It was nothing to do with carnival. It was just a little party. But people said, oh, yeah, you know, because they'd come out to see that. In 65, Ronnie Lazett tried to recreate something called, I think it was known as the Portobello Fair, F-A-Y-R-E or something, which mm -hmm. is something that's been going on for about 100 years. And all kinds of people came there, including travelers and various different nationalities to show their wares. And I believe that a few Calypsonians may have attended. It only went along Acklam Road. It wasn't around, you know, like a, a big thing. And then in 66, she got permission from the police to actually run a proper parade, which they did all the way around, well, certainly up to, um, I think, Notting Hill Gate and back. So there are three stories. But the, 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 so the people who say 64, 64 wasn't the day when, it wasn't the year when Notting Hill Carnival started at all. But they did have a little kind of mini thing going on which some people attribute because there was a tiny little parade with a steel pan trio around the area. They like to say that. But the thing is, read Ishmael Blagrove's book to get, I think he's pretty accurate in his facts, if you're interested in that aspect. That's Good. all. No, no, okay. that, that's fine. Obviously, there, there will be uh, contestations. Cool. Uh, but what I like to add, certainly, and uh, I have respect for that, because how, but I think we, 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 we're so desperate to own things that, uh, we, we, I don't say falsify, but Caribbean or the Notting Hill Carnival never started as a, 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 an African Caribbean thing or a Caribbean thing. It was a multicultural thing. And in fact, it was aimed at young children. You are right to say what actually happened was that the fair had ended years ago and they revived something that was a tradition in, in, in West London. So do okay. you know this image? No, I don't know this image. It's looking like some, uh, no. If that's Claudia on the left, then I was thinking yes, of the African conference, but it, no. Please tell us who, who it is. Okay. So it is Claudia. Is that Paul Robson's wife there? Yes. Oh, that's Paul. So, then I've got, I've got an image. Go ahead. Okay. No, right. no, no, talk about this because I've got another image. Talk about this then. No, I don't really have anything to say. It's just I have, um, I just, got this image from I did an interview with um the Othelith group um Kojo Ishan. Yes. And and I this was one of the bits of memorabilia that they had that you could take away. Oh okay. And of course I snatched it up because Claudia Jones was on the podium. So when I saw your newspaper, yes. I just remember this so I went to take it out to share with people. That's it. Okay. What yeah. what was the exhibition on? women on aeroplanes so it was oh. really highlighting um women of um sheroes of the african liberation movement oh, okay okay yeah. so let me share this with you so can you see this yeah see? so this image was used by the lambeth local paper so uh, on the left is claudia jones Next to is a fellow communist. You do you know that Claude Jones was jailed and uh, mm. ejected from America yes. for being yes. a, a communist. So that's Paul Robson, who was not yes. a communist. He talking about uh, Cecil yes. Nebruger. This guy was also multifaceted. He was a lawyer. He was an athlete, mm. a singer. What wasn't an actor? <laughs> what wasn't this guy, Paul? Rob oh, and he spoke so many languages. And I think, it, I'm not quite sure which oh. African language he spoke because I think he went to either the LSE or SOAS. So he spoke many, mm -hmm. he was a big star in, in Russia. He could speak Russian. So he played Othello and stuff speaking Russian. So these guys obviously are Claudia Jones and uh, go back a long way for Robson. Mm -hmm. And next to him is the first wife of Marcus Garvey so that's uh, Ashwood, Gavi. Amy, Amy and, Ashwood. Yeah, the Ashwood, mm -hmm. Gavi. And then next to her is the wife of uh, uh, Paul Robson. And next is the wife of the, the older man who's the, who's the mayor. So uh, yeah, the, the West Indian Gazette had a lot of fundraising uh, events. So they would always have Paul Robson supporting. So this would have been at the, what is it? Their civic center, whatever it's called, <laughs> town hall, town hall. So they did a lot of fundraising projects. So that's where this photo comes from. So thanks for, yeah. I, I want to say to Kwaku, um, 
I the the image I showed you, like yeah. in my mind, I have an image of Claudia Jones at this age. Okay. So to see her so young mm. in the photo you have shown is unusual for me. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah, I I have a visual of her more as a mature woman. Oh, okay. Mm. Can I just give you a side story? Amy Ashugavi, what she's wearing is a kente that comes from Ghana. Mm -hmm. What happened was that her maternal great grandmother had their history. Um, Jamaican, what am I thinking? Cuba. Either her parents must have been in Cuba because a lot, a lot of Jamaicans went to Cuba to make their fortune and stuff. But nevertheless, her maternal great-great-grandmother told her the story about the uh, abduction of her mother, who was of royal stock from Ghana, Gold Coast, and brought to the Caribbean. So at some time, she went and traced that story and ended up in Ghana, and she found the family. And in fact, when she went, the story was corroborated by the, the, that royal family. So they gave her uh, a Ghanaian name, Yabuahima. And indeed, on the 25th of November, I'm repeating something called interrogating language. So we look at terminologies and stuff. And then there's something also called Aranin. Aranin is uh, putting African names to p African people who don't have uh, African names, right? So that uh, you, if they do great things, it's very easy to identify them as African. So she had her own, Yabuahima. I think Marcos was called Aben. Aben is this, the, the, the horn of the cow. When there was war, you would blow that. So uh, the warning, the, the warning. So I gave all these guys names. It's called Ar Aranin. It's somewhere on the internet. So you can look for it. So anyway, that's my anecdote from, from this photo. Do you know anything about um, E.R. Braithwaite, who wrote To Sir With Love? Yes. I was told by Mr. James Fairweather, who knew um, Claudia Jones. He calls her Miss Jones. Yes. And she Mona Lisa. So he'd always sing that to her. But what he said was E.R. Braithwaite used to come to the office and when he was teaching in school, you know. Okay. And Joan said to him, because he kept telling her all was ha what was happening, why don't you write a story? And he said, that is how To Sir With Love came about. Wow. I don't oh. know if you heard. He said Braithwaite used to bring um, chapters in and Miss Jones would look at it and go through it. But Braithwaite, I don't want to cast any aspersions. I don't know if Miss Jones ever got any credit. So I'm told, but she was the one who encouraged him, apparently, to write that book. I just thought people might like to know that and that she loved Mona Lisa and he used to sing it to her. Okay, so that's fantastic. I mean, that's the type of things you get from, from, from these sessions. Yeah, I, I know James uh, Fairweather. Let me tell you something about the Windrush. And I, I think we still have to investigate. There are a number of people who say they came on the Windrush. The problem is that you do not find their names on the list. Oh, on that score. I've checked it out. Don't say anything. <laughs> so um, now I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, Miss Miss Mr. Fairweather. I, I speak to him from time to time. If you look at one of the people that had a lot of celebrity from covering the Windrush was a guy who ended up writing quite a useful history. Uh, slightly dated, but nevertheless, it's still uh, a seminal piece of work on British African history. Was a guy called Fryer, Peter Fryer, and the book was called. Can anyone tell me what the book is called? Since it's just gone out of my head. I've forgotten. I've forgotten. Staying power. Thank you very much. And it's, what he did was that he was one of the few people, journalists who went back because most of the interviews were once they did it on the day, and that was it. And when he went back to Clapham Common, 
most of the people that gone out of this found jobs or they, they've been put into uh, lodgings. I think they were taken to Peckham side. But he met a, a guy who gave his name as not James, but as uh, Fergus, Festus, uh, Festus. Yes, yeah. So uh, unfortunately, Mr. Fairweather sometimes is hard of hearing. So when you're talking to me on the phone, it's a bit difficult. So until I, he lives in Croydon, by the way, until I can get to Croydon and really have a face to face, mm -hmm. I suspect that was him in the paper that yes. interviewed by uh, P P P P Peter Fr Fryer. Oh, the other thing in terms of uh, the West Indian Gazette, he was the advertising manager on the West Indian Gazette. Okay, a good friend of uh, Claudia Jones. And in fact, I'm not sure it showed in the segment that I, I showed today, but she used to own number one Bassett Road in Labra Grove. And that was like a, a, a shelter, a community center, a place for discussion. So you can imagine that Claudia Jones won this so many times because Claudia Jones was very much involved with uh, uh, in Ashwood, the, the campaign on the streets of, of, of uh, what should I say, Labra Grove. Oh, Alexander the Great said, it's great that he could play the song whilst the lady was alive. That's fantastic. So I can say that as part of our organization, BTWSC, we were able to honor <coughs> the name Jocelyn. And I think you must have seen a photo of Nana with her uh, at one of the events that we did. So this was our ode to uh, Dame Jocelyn. <laughs> focus on sport and music and entertainment. And we have the ability to do a whole range of other things and we need to do that. Well, I'm probably sitting here because I'm the first black woman that was made a dame in this country. And that was my second public award. I was made an OBE in 1972 for my work in race relations. We got the campaign against, the campaign against racial discrimination, of which I was a key member with race relations legislation. And I was also involved with human rights here, which has given us uh, the present commission for equality and human rights have come together. And so that sort of work, mm. and being the first black woman governor of the BBC, as well as all this the This was a presentation we gave to her, handmade. I've been involved in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was very proud of that handmade. Someone in Harrow did it. So it was nice to give us something that someone had taken their time to, to, to make. But you've got yes. two questions. Great. One is somebody who needs clarification. What was the progressive union you mentioned? Oh, oh, oh. African Progressive Union. Okay. It was formed, I think, in 1918. Uh, yes. So the, it, was a, it was a lot. Sorry, go ahead. The other question is, where was the first UK England carnival held? Right. Again, you see, there's this contestation. What do you mean by carnival? Mm -hmm. So it is possible that it's not Notting Hill carnival. And it's Miss, is Alexander D. great in the house? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's very possible if you go by the real definition or a, a form of definition of, of carnival, uh, carnival, the mass masquerade is an essential part of it. This a continental yeah. African trying to think he knows about carnival, which is very much an African Caribbean experience. Uh, also, the still pants and the procession on the street. And yes, the Londoners started, but as I said, the 68, 66 was a multi-ethnic thing, a multicultural thing. Mm. So it did not necessarily have an African Caribbean flavor. So this is a good question. And I think the Londoners who want to support not Notting Hill Carnival can come from one angle, but I think to be fair, it, it should be Leeds Carnival. Leeds Carnival started very much with an African Caribbean flavor. And the great thing is that the guy that started it's alive. A guy called, I think it's John, his last name is Francis. If you go to Opal 22 at uh, Entertainment, Opal 22, they are on YouTube and Facebook. There's an interview with this guy called Francis because I think um, a few months ago, they did something on Carnival. 
and they interviewed him. Fantastic. What I like about him, all of from the Caribbean, he's very Pan-Africanist. He was talking in terms of African. He said he was he had to bring his Africanness into 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 this. So in answer to your question, no, no, no whoever asked the question, I'll it's say true. yeah. If you want to be honest, it has to be Leeds. So let's Leeds Carnival. When? Oh, I think it started in uh, 66, 67. So the okay. point being that it had more of the, Af the elements that speak to an African Caribbean carnival in the Caribbean. That's what I mean, because the London 66 and 67, oh, they had hippies. They had hippies in, in Notting Hill. It was everybody, gypsies were involved. Everybody, the mishmash of, 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 yeah. of Labro Grove was what was, was there. Yes, so it's a multicultural thing. It was from 68 onwards that it started shifting towards an African Caribbean thing. And then by the 70s, it had because they kicked out uh, Ronnie Lasley anyway. And then obviously, one of the people, and then uh, they also introduced reggae. That was, I think, 72 and stuff like that. Yeah. So. You know, Dr. Velma has her hand up. Okay. Dr. Velma, can you please unmute and ask your question? Yes. I wanted to say, where would you then place the um, St. Pancras Town Hall Carnival in 59? Because it's still a London Caribbean Carnival. No, no. Uh, it was yeah. yeah, no. So we cannot compare both. That is why it's fine to describe it as uh, a Caribbean Carnival. It's what you call a cabaret type. So you cannot have something on the street with something indoors. So I don't think they, it's two different things. So I think it's unfair to start saying, oh, that was the first carnival. No, if you're looking at street carnival, uh, then it has to be whether you want to talk about Leeds or talk about Notting Hill. So I think uh, for the purpose uh, of- Dr. Kwaku, can I yeah. just come in? It's only because over the years, I've also taught Caribbean history and you would then have to fight with some. I am fine, but you would then have Absolutely. to- Absolutely. Some historians who I know that I know in fact yes somewhere yes, to make that point. No, no, absolutely, I agree with you. And indeed, I don't know why I wrote it because I said something that uh Claudia Jones is uh, I don't agree with her being the mother of carnival, but certainly the mother of Caribbean carnival. And if you want to come test me, but none of them came, and I, I'm not gonna mention the name of someone. Well, um, hold on one moment. There's someone who documents the Caribbean history and he emailed us and said, oh gosh, here we go. And rather he was complimentary. So I think people are shifting because we have not had any counter arguments because the prevailing thought has been going. We've been bombarded with, with that. But now slowly people are seeing that there's another history that needs to be spoken to counter the prevailing, which is not always historic. It's ahistorical. Ahistorical is not historic. So no, Brad, uh, Sister Velma, you're absolutely right. But I think, if, oh, there's a, another uh, culturalist offline who has been talking to me, but I said he didn't want to come in here because you know why? He's tired. Because the <laughs> arguments that I'm making, he makes, and he's a Caribbean, an esteemed person, a very esteemed person. He goes outside the country to do Caribbean culture, but he, he, he didn't want to have this t talk. It's like, what you know, you know. If they don't know, I, I'm tired about that. So, Sister Velma, I know, but I have to say my piece. I can't help it. Okay. Can I just add that Bosco Holder mm. and the great Edric Connor, Geraldine mm. Connor's father, mm. did something for the BBC in 1944 but it was only filmed. It wasn't like on the street. So I don't know how far back you want to go in terms of representations of Caribbean carnivalesque. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm, no, back I, to 44, I, the first time it was documented by the BBC. So I mean, oh, and, and, no, you know, and mm. in the fifties, all these guys had uh, programs. There, there was a Car Caribbean show on the BBC. So there was a series of Car Caribbean things. Oh, can I just say, you mentioned Ed, Ed Connor. Uh, Edric. Edric, Edric Connor. Edric Connor, yes. He was the first, I'll say the first because we've got to be careful about the first, but his version of Day O predates, uh, what's his name, the guy in America? What's his name? Are you talking about Bella Fonte? Yeah. Everybody his version. Yeah. And now they get into this copyright situation, right? 
the the cop uh you know you have to pay a uh, higher better funds because they've copyrighted uh there and i'm saying people have done it before and if in the oxford uh oxford <laughs> university press transcribed it so they have a copyright in in in, in uh, there but if you do Dale, you gotta pay uh, Harry Belafonte. <laughs> Never mind that Edric Connor did a version long before he he did. That's why yeah. I've, yeah, as a business, so right. you know you gotta know the rules and regulations. Any more questions or comments, Nana? No, no. yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm looking out to see if anybody is raising their hand or. Oh, today, Joan Joan has been rather quiet. Maybe she's tired. <laughs> no, I am tired. Yeah. I thought I like listening to your voice. Because <laughs> normally she can't wait to, to, to input. Yes. Do you want to say something? Yes. Sit back. Oh, I got to unmute. Yes, you can speak. Yeah. Eve. Eve Nobrega, yeah, still here. Um, yes. No mention of, um, oh gosh, I'm getting feet. No mention of um, women writers, I'm thinking, and Andrea Levy who passed away, I think, last year. Mm -hmm. um, small island and all that. Sure, 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 sure. Can you hear me? We, we can, can hear you. We, well. we, we can, we can you hear, hear you. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, no, I thought there might have been a mention of, because um, she's done quite a, well, she's left a legacy. Oh, well, so many people left a legacy, but today yeah, we focused on uh, certain yeah. types of but i mean you oh, okay. the point was that no no hold on the point was that after i did what i did people were were were, were free to bring in whoever they thought were inspirational women so oh. it's for you to bring it mm -hmm. in not to depend on someone to have brought it in yeah, oh mm -hmm. can i just say that i haven't read the book but you know what uh one of the theater companies and i think the national theater did a free show in online it was fantastic I think they did it for a week, so it may be offline now. So I know people have been talking about it. I don't read, to be honest, I, I, I don't read novels and stuff. I know he had the wound rush in there by his, his father or uncle and blah, blah, blah. I liked reading, uh, was it, nonfiction. So, yeah. But anyway, so big up to Andrew Levy. Yeah, sadly, who passed away la last year. Oh, yes. Oh. Yes. 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 So yeah, we can talk about other women. It's not just the ones that I highlighted. You've got uh, Dr. Velma, who's got her hand up. Okay. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to say, I may well have missed it. Did you mention Donald Hines? Because he was also very active with Miss Jones at the time. And I think he wrote a book. Um, tell me, is it Mother Country? Mother, can, Mother Country is a, a late book. In the 60s, he wrote a book. The, the name, Ben, something illusion. Is yes. it Shattering Illusion? Something. He wrote, no, uh, no, no, Shattering Illusion was written by uh, one of the communists, one of the communists who went to uh, Claude Jones. But, um, no, anyway, he wrote a book in the 60s that talked about the African Caribbean experience. Really. But I know Donald, the problem is that I'm a bit worried about him because in recent times, when I email, I don't get replies, so I don't know his state, you know. Uh, but yes, he, he worked, I can tell you the story. He came as a bus conductor. So that's the situation which London Transport since the mid fifties were recruits in, 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 in the Caribbean. So he was on the Streatham uh, bus garage. So he would have done the Brixton Road. And one day, either he met, uh, what's his name? Oh, Des is it Desmond? 250, 250 uh, Brixton Road, the guy, Theo, uh, no, Theo Campbell, Theo Campbell's record shop was at the bottom of 250. And uh, he told him, up, oh yeah, no, he, these guys used to sell the papers wherever they could. So he'd come on the bus and was selling his paper to him. I the West Indian Gazette. So that's how he met Donald Hines. And Donald Hines said, oh, he wants to write. So Don, uh, Theo said, yeah, okay, come back, come up to uh, 250. And he may have made an introduction to, uh, what's her name, to Claudia Jones. And they didn't have any staff writer. Uh, I think he was impressed with him. So he became what he called the city reporter. 
normally city reporters are people who re report about business or whatever. Well, certainly London, mm -hmm. when we talk about a city. Mm -hmm. But yes, yeah, so he was the only, there was another person, if I look, if my memory serves right, looking through the old West Indian uh, Gazette. So yeah, Donald Hines, I, we didn't mention him, but I'm happy to mention now, became the, uh, the staff writer from then till the paper folded. And he's still alive, but as I said, I'm not quite sure uh, what state he is in now. But he, he was, he went from, you see how people can progress from being a bus conductor, he went to become a university lecturer and he wrote a few books. So Mother Country, I wrote, I think he, he wrote in the last 10 years, but he'd written a, a few things uh, prior to that, yeah. Yes, Journey to Illusion. <laughs> Oh, that is the book, yeah. Thank you very much. Jenny to Illusion. Yeah, yeah uh, Dr. Velma put it in the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, can I ask? It's a question, it's a bit um, out of it. Just you talk about the West Indian Gazette folding. Yes. So, what is it about uh, these publications? I mean, is it that there wasn't a demand for it? Uh, because, you know, when you tell the story of uh, the UNI ACL, they also had a newspaper, and that mm -hmm. seemed to be something that went right across the world was read so much but what was it what is it about the papers is it that it wasn't it, it wasn't commercial enough what was it that okay. was wrong right luckily uh with the negro world that's a different one because it was on the back of a very very successful organization with uh, lots of membership so the membership could sustain it and the year now was a membership so a dues pay membership uh, collected so they could have uh, funds. Most of these organizations aren't, or most people say, make excuses so that there's not enough fund generated by the by, by the mem membership. So most of these papers are niche publications. I they depend on their core markets to sustain them. Normally, the numbers aren't there, and then. Why do papers survive? Well, obviously things have changed because of the internet, but traditionally papers survive on advertising. The core audience do not have great <coughs> marketing spend to advertise. So it's really half the time a labor of love situation. So someone like Donald Hines didn't really get paid. What he got was, was the pecs. I think he went to, not, if not Russia, Yugoslavia, or he certainly went to Vienna on one of those trips. So he would have gone to where they had these sort of like labor or left-leaning uh, conferences. So those, those were the pecs he would have had. And also he interviewed the celebrities of the day. So okay. yeah, but not payment, those not enough cash in the kitty for the West Indian Gazette to pay people. So the answer to your question is, the, 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 the core audience is often not big enough to, to sustain it financially. Okay, thank you. And how did Claudia Jones keep body and soul together? Because you just said, yeah. uh, we're seeing and Gadek didn't have enough money. Yeah. Um, so how did she pay her bills? Because there was no welfare state. Now, this is where I'm going to speculation land. Because if you know her, she was always well-dressed. Well-dressed costs money. And considering that the paper didn't make mu much money, it's, it's a question you've asked, and I'm just answering off the top of my head, and I, I've put in the, the, what should I say, the notice that I'm going to speculation land. I suspect that probably some nice friends and family would have helped. Okay. Because uh, uh, people always spoke about hairdressing, and that costs money. So just that alone, not what she ate, but just a close loan. Uh, well, would you say money. that like uh, Marx was sustained by his friend Engels? And so maybe Claudia, who was to the left of Marx. Probably, yeah. Marx. I mean, as soon as you, you, you asked the question, as I was speculating, but I could see yeah, it I, because I, 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 I couldn't see it coming from the paper, but she went to the social things. But of course, people like Paul Robson from time to time would, who had a fundraiser to keep it going for as long as, as, as it could. So obviously when money came to Kitty, obviously she could pay a rent or, or whatever. But of course she had a partner, Manu. Uh, Manu, I think, came, he, Manu is a long name. So um, Machanda or something like that. I think he came from uh, India. He, he was a rebel because he was a lefty. He came from a rich family. So maybe some of the proceeds, although he was a sort of a rebel, he's, he, he may have maintained some of that money to help Claudia. Okay. 
And Dr. Velma, do you want to yeah, ask? Let me just jump in here. Yes, I think friends helped her, but I did see a documentary, and she, when she died, as you know, was it Christmas Day? Yeah. She was surrounded by unopened envelopes. Bills were piling up. And that really distressed me because she was working so hard oh, yeah. for the community. Yet here was this lady, she literally couldn't pay her bills. They were unopened, mm. lots of envelopes. Mm. And I think the neighbor spoke as well. A, a white guy spoke in the film about her, you know, the room in which she lived. And she was very ill at the time. Mm. And uh, she died alone. And, you know, when you think about it, the work she did surrounded by so many people and she died alone. I wept when I saw that film. You know, I still think about her. Mm. So I just wanted to share that. Mm. No, thank you. But it happens. There's a, there are a whole lot of what you call community soldiers. Community soldiers. I mean, we're not far removed from that. Half the things that we, we, we do is by, 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 by passion. I mean, uh, yeah, so it's not su su surprising. There's a whole lot of people who do things and there's no recompense from anywhere, but they're just driven to do what they, they have to do. Yeah, actually, that guy is still alive. He's called Eric, Eric Levy, uh, the, the neighbor. So at some time, and he's very sprightly. So if you think that uh, Claudia Jones died, well, getting to the 50 years, so how old would this guy be? Certainly uh, around the 70s, but it's quite sprightly. You see him at these events. So maybe someone needs to re-interview him, really. Oh, I do know that English Heritage is looking to put a plaque at the building that they live in, in Havistock. Is it Havistock? I mean, it's uh, Hampstead. Not Ham it's not really Hampstead, but that side of La London. So they, they're looking to put a plaque there. And of course, uh, the, she lived in, Claudia Jones lived in uh, South London. I, there's speculation that she may have lived in two different properties, but she certainly lived in one uh, near Oval. And uh, the, I think the lady that owns the property is quite keen for a plaque. So I think uh, the councillor did speak about that. So there's a potential of having a plaque. But I, I cannot see the English heritage having two plaques for one person because they, there's a great demand on, on their plaque system. Of course, I, I'm sure I can put this in the public domain because uh, Nubin Jack is also looking to do a plaque. He's not quite sure where, but he's also mm -hmm. he talks about it. So maybe okay. after COVID, there'll certainly be a plaque to uh, Claudia, possibly in North London and South London. I think we need to, well, first of all, thank you for the work you've done. I know it's a labor of love, but it's a labor of love that we appreciate. Uh, because it's been fascinating watching the films, the clips, and thank you for the people you invited, because hearing from Dr. Johnson and then hearing from uh, Sister Blossom, you know, people who actually met the people. And don't forget Eve, who is still there. Yes, <laughs> and, yeah, because she could tell us about her mother. And again, she gave us that aspect that people forget, that people who are multi, what's the word you use for people who have several skills? I think she said multifaceted, but uh, no, no. There's a word you use. No, 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 no. no Ambi what? Ambidextrous. No, no. Multitasking. You know, uh, Tasking. Like Imhotep. He was an architect. Yeah. He was a doctor. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. What, what, what was it? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> well, when you get the I word, get word. I sorry. No, no, polymath. In that case, it's a polymath. The polymath is the person oh. who is killed mm. in different. Uh, oh, yes, because disciplines. I was struck when Sister Eve was talking about her mother. Mm. With uh, she's uh, she was a composer, a musician. We knew of her poetry, mm. but here you have somebody with these multi skills, mm. and I think mm. it is it is mm. important that sometimes we recognize that some of these people are not ordinary, in that they've got so many talents, and sometimes we know one aspect of them. And thank you for the work you do because it it unearths a rich history, which in a way makes us proud. I mean, Jane, Jane, Jocelyn, when you mentioned her and the things she did in terms of, you know, not only her activism, her BBC, her, you know, doing this, and she was proudly middle class. I think often we talk about the working mm. classes and we forget that mm. every class has a role to play. And she did what she did from her position of knowledge, what yeah. she knew. Also, the way you managed to capture uh, Baroness Scotland. 
And we saw these, and I think one thing that struck me in one of her things, she said, although they were a family, was it of 12, each one was made to feel as if they were the only child. And that shows that she had very gifted parents. Their parenting skills were second to none. They had confident children who were very secure and knew they were loved. So I, I'm, on behalf of everybody, I want to thank you for these films because you make these wonderful films. You capture these, you know, they're capturing the buildings and telling us about how heritage is represented in the city in which we live. Because um, at the moment where some of us are campaigning to get names changed, the names of enslavers and torturers off our buildings and off things, and some people don't understand, but it's good to know that there are people who have also lived and contributed whose names ought to be there. So thank you for the research. The research is extremely important. And it's without this research, nothing happens. Um, I wanna also use one of your books, you know, uh, African Voices, for those who know, is one of the, uh, I noticed there's a quote from Dame Joycelyn that you mentioned, but there's one that um, Shirley Chisholm, she said something that I think is fascinating and it's captured in the book. And it, you said, you don't make progress by standing in the, on the sidelines, whimpering and complaining. You make progress by implementing ideas. So I want to salute you for implementing this idea. If there's history to be told, it means somebody has to research it, talk to people. You interviewed um, the, uh, uh, oh, Ealing, oh, the name just got... Huntley. Huntley. Jessica, Auntie Jessica. The Huntleys. Exactly, the Huntleys. You, uh, sister yeah. Jessica, you did, uh, you, Auntie Jessica, you went and interviewed her. We can, so we got that value now, although she's gone. I noticed that Awalasa has raised her hand, so I would like us to hand over to, but it's a big thank you from all of us for an interesting evening. And I know that, yes, uh, thank you, Sister Patricia, for the word polymath. I've noticed that a lot of the people we have are polymaths. And I think it's something that we as the African community need to recognize that we have that greatness in the community. And um, as Philomena's mom said, have the courage of your convictions. We need to work on our talent. And as Shirley Chisholm said, don't look at the problems, look for the solutions. That's so, Sister Sawa, it's over to you. I'm sorry, I hadn't put up my hand, but just to say thank you to everybody who attended this session. It was great. And thank you, Nana, you, you do what you do, you're brilliant. Thank you, Kwaku, you are excellent. And uh, just thank you to every single person who was and here. And for me, a big thank you, you to this. Good night. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> wonderful links in the chat.